hanging around, hanging around. Kids got alligator blood. Why is it that when I think of English people, I think of them talking like this? Cheerio, jolly good shout, Major. Oh yes, yes. It's Jemis, is it? I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know why I think of English people talking like that because I've never actually seen an English person talk like that. But for some odd reason, I have this image and voice in my head of them talking and ending all of their sentences in a question. Because that's what you do, isn't it? You've got to answer, you've got to finish all your sentences in a question, don't you? It's proper, isn't it? I don't know why that's true, actually. English people do like ending their sentences in a question, don't they? They love it, don't they? <laughs> um, big news for me personally, I finished, I just finished my fifth screenplay, which is a huge huge relief for me because this last screenplay was just a huge bitch of a screenplay it was oh i can't tell you how relieved i am to finish this fucking bastard of a screenplay it was so difficult to write um because you know for a lot of reasons i know that i understand that people don't want to hear artists complain about shit but too bad because it's part of the reason I have this podcast is so I can complain. No, uh, part of the reason is that I have this podcast is, is I don't like talking about my personal life to people I know. And because I'm dysfunctional, I have to do it in a mediated way through technology rather than doing it face to face. Uh, that's partly what, what the problem. But another part of the problem is most people just don't understand what it's like to be an artist, at least the people I, I'm around. Um, so there aren't that many that, that I know personally that understand it. So it's hard to explain. You just, you just, you, either you get it or you don't. And if you understand what it's like, then this podcast is for you. You know, people who, who know what it's like to kind of sit down and just try to write and finish something. It's just, you know, Sometimes it's it's it can be really rewarding. So like this last screenplay, I just felt so good. Like, ah, I did it. And then sometimes it's just like I just want to slowly walk into the ocean and dry, my, dry myself because none of it is working. None of it. And if I hand in a piece of turd, uh, I'm not going to be able to live with myself. And there are moments where I'm writing this and I'm just like, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this fucking maze that I just put myself into. It's like I wrote myself into a labyrinth that has no way out. That's what it feels like sometimes. But I did it. I finally got myself out of it. I wrote myself out of the labyrinth and, uh, you know, all's well that ends well, which is one of my all-time favorite titles. And I almost wanted to title this screenplay All's Well That Ends Well. That's sort of how I look at um, romantic comedies. Basically, romantic comedies is life is chaotic and random, and sometimes that chaos and randomness works out for you. <laughs> and we call those moments romantic comedies, when the chaos somehow smiles upon you and you smile back. And that's what we call falling in love. And that is what this story that I just wrote is about. But the last screenplay that I just wrote um, has some, I think, poignant moments. And uh, it's a, in some respects, it is a romantic comedy, but it's also about getting over the death of a father. And, um, you know, this is a, it's difficult to do justice to that theme. Uh, it's very hard to do justice to any sort of true personal uh, struggle that, that people go through. It's very, just, it's very difficult to do justice to that just through words and words alone in a way. And so part of the challenge of writing a screenplay, I think, is 
to just have these words on a page really elicit a powerful response in you, whether it's laughter or some kind of pathos, some kind of catharsis. Now, I won't get too much into the details, but the people that hired me to write this screenplay, I was supposed to, I set a deadline to finish this screenplay on this last Monday. That was my deadline. August 1st, I'm going to be done. And I actually finished it the day before, and usually I'm not somebody that, you know, uh, does things usually I'm I'm asking for delays <laughs> you know usually I'm asking for more time I always want more time just always 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 and then the, so it was a good feeling to just be done at 11 o'clock the night before it's really due and I'm just like I'm done you know so I'm supposed to meet up with them on the Monday and something tragic happens and uh one of the people that hired me to uh, write this script, their father passed away on the night before I'm supposed to meet up with them. And I'm supposed to meet up with them about a script that deals with somebody losing their father. So you can imagine how, uh, just how sad this must be for the man. And how difficult this this situation becomes in a way. And how strange. I don't know what to expect. I don't know how the conversations are going to go now. Because it's a strange thing to hire somebody to write a story about somebody losing their father. And then you go to meet with them to talk about this story. Right on the week where you lose your father. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really know what to expect. I'm not good at these situations with people that I don't know well. I'm very good at these situations if I know the person well. So, you know, it's you know, it's a very interesting thing. Um, on the one hand, it's sort of the reason the real life experience is really the reason I write to begin with. Um, but at the same time, this is like this feels pretty close to home. I gotta admit, admit really. So, anyway, that's just been my life recently. I so it was a huge achievement for me to finish my fifth screenplay I usually don't take the time to like I don't know about you but I think most people don't really take the time to appreciate the things that they've done I know I don't do it but it really hit home for me that I'm like you know I've written five screenplays I've probably written about a thousand songs I've recorded about maybe three EPs um, of music and uh, I graduated with a master's degree I interned at Journalist for Human Rights you know, I've done a, I've been really kind of busy in these last like six, seven years. Uh, moving to LA in, is included in all of that. So I don't know. It was just it's rare when I sort of take a moment to pat myself on the back, but it's absolutely important that you do it, that you sort of give yourself a moment of just going like, well done, and literally patting yourself on the back. <laughs> Try not to do it while you're driving. This is my only piece of advice. Um, anyway, th this episode is really going to be about... Uh, I just wanted to talk about the movie uh, Captain Fantastic. Um, partly because I am... I guess I can call myself a screenwriter now. Now that I'm you know, officially getting paid to, to, to be a screenwriter. Um, so I watched Captain Fantastic knowing nothing about it. That's generally my rule for watching movies. I like to not know anything about it. And if it's an actor I like or a director I like, I'll just go watch it and, and I actually prefer not to know anything. So I just I want to maximize the amount of surprise in any movie that I can. Because as we all know, movies can be in some way or another formulaic. That's part of the beauty of films. But it's also part of the frustration that we have where if it's too formulaic, you kind of know what's going to happen and it feels predictable. So because of that, I try not to I try to know as little as possible. So I don't even know what genre I'm, I'm watching. So that way I can't really go, oh, well, this is a comedy. So I kind of know how it's going to end or oh, this is 
you know, a political movie. So I kind of know what the message is. And if it's too obvious, you know, you just, you're not going to have as much fun. So I go to watch Captain Fantastic because I'm like, I look at the movie, whatever, listings or whatever, it says Viggo Mortensen. And I'm like, what? Viggo Mortensen's got a movie out? I didn't know this. So I'm like, I got to go check this out. I go to watch it knowing absolutely nothing. I sit in the movie theater. It's pitch black. The scene opens, and all I see is a scene in like some sort of wilderness, like the forest, like it almost looks like the jungle, okay? And some animal is about to be slaughtered, and people have their faces painted, and I'm like, what the fuck am I watching? And then I thought, oh my god, I'm in the wrong movie theater. I'm watching Tarzan. Well, how, like, what's wrong? Am I getting old and that I don't realize that I just bought the ticket for the wrong movie or am I so old <laughs> I'm not that old but I just thought it really freaked me out I was like I think I just walked into the wrong movie theater so I turn on my phone which you're not supposed to do it's pitch black and my phone is like super bright you can get blinded by the light of the cell phone and I look at my ticket and I realize I'm in the right movie this is Captain Fantastic and I was like I thought this was going to be some sort of family drama or dramedy you know and I was like, I'm not expect I wasn't expecting Tarzan. <laughs> to me, that is the beauty of this film, Captain Fantastic, because it is absolutely not at all what you expect. It's nothing at all. It just it defies so many conventions. I just I, I don't think I'll, I'll do justice to the film. I don't think this review will do justice to it. But just the fact that the opening sequence made me think I was watching Tarzan, and it wasn't. That I, I thought I was watching a dramedy, family dramedy, and then I realized I think I'm watching Tarzan and it turns out I'm wrong. Just made me go, great, I'm in. I'm in. So, what made this movie so, I think, memorable is um, the last, I'll give you a background as to why I think a movie like this. First of all, I just, I just loved it. I mean, the acting alone is spectacular. The writing... Finding that fine line between dramedy, drama and comedy is, it is a dramedy. Uh, finding that fine line between drama and comedy is so, so difficult. For anybody who's been in there trying to write that line and achieving that fine line, you know how hard it is to do. It's extremely difficult. And the job of most writers is to make it look like it's easy. To make it look like the writing came out effortless. And then everyone thinks we're just lazy fucks and really we're not. We're just, we're ripping our hairs out trying to get the scenes to come out right and feel natural. And this movie, it just looks so effortless. And I know how, how that can't be true just from personal experience. It's extremely difficult to write a script as good as Captain Fantastic. To have children say dialogue like this in this movie without it feeling fake is almost impossible and this guy Matt Ross just achieved the impossible and then not only that but to have such young kids perform at the level that they did for this movie where usually child actors feel fake you know and I'm sorry to say but if you watch the first um, Star Wars episode one with the little kid you can just tell like you know he's a kid most kids are not going to know how to uh, give a certain level of performance because they're too young to understand a certain level of nuance and complexity required to mimic naturalism and when you see these kids in this movie Captain Fantastic it's just I mean well it's not just kids it's also teenagers and, and so on like the ages vary from like being a little kid to being a you know uh, young college, you know, he's, he's first year college, basically. That's, that's the age groups we're dealing with. All of them are just spectacular, the performances. Not one false note, not one false scene. Everything is just feels exactly like it's believable that this family lives off the grid and that these kids are this way, which is these kids are, I don't want to give too much away, but the kids are very, unusual in the way that they think and talk and it's very hard to do that in a way that's believable but this film pulls it off you just feel like you buy into it immediately and part of it is that opening scene where you're just like what the fuck am i watching 
why am I watching an animal getting killed? <laughs> and it turns out that Matt Ross um, lived in many hippie communes growing up. So it's, I was surprised at how, how much of his personal life came into this film. And I think, again, there is a, a maxim amongst writers uh, that I think is generally true. I mean, you can't take it as a dogmatic gospel, but um, uh, the general maxim is uh, write what you know. And I, th and I think there's a lot of truth to that. There's a lot of validity to... to I think writing just comes to life when it's infused with the 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 um the personal and the visceral there's something about your visceral uh that visceral part of you there's something about that that gives life to your art and if you can manage to tap into that it really communicates and speaks for you in a way that goes beyond your conscious mind uh and i think sometimes art can suffer if you get too conscious about it if you get too thinky about it I mean, you don't want to be brain dead, but you don't want to be too in your head about it either. And uh, this this movie really felt like a, a very personal, but also very intelligent at the same time, very emotional and visceral, but also very thoughtful. And and it's it's so difficult to to ride that balance, but this movie does it. Um, so my last screenplay, one that I wrote last year, I've been trying to marry my political views with my artistic visions. And I didn't know how I was feeling, but I was having a little bit of a crisis. And that is, um, I really felt like my artistic visions were in some respects at odds with my political goals. And as a result, I felt that I was starting to feel like it's almost inevitable that um, any film you make will be interpreted as propaganda um, in the sense that if you make a movie that isn't overtly political, you're sort of contributing to the, the brokenness of the system. Uh, that I, and I agree with people like Noam Chomsky, for instance, um, and just generally the progressive left, that the, the system is broken. It's inherently corrupt. Uh, it inherently fa favors concentrated wealth and power, and it uses concentrated wealth and power to uh, dictate every single human interaction to favor the wealthy and to screw over the masses. And so in a climate like that, if you accept it to be true, as I do, in such a climate, um, it becomes very difficult to position your art in a way that... Um, uh, challenges it partly because there's a pressure to not be political or overtly political because if you are you're going to piss off a bunch of people you know like there's that story recently of Bradley Cooper where Republicans found out some Republicans found out that uh, Bradley Cooper is a liberal because he was at the Democratic National Convention in the audience and um, some of them were like he's dead to me there were like literally tweets <laughs> people of conservatives saying he's dead to me now you know because they thought this how can the man who played Chris Kyle be a liberal you know they were so shocked uh you know which is kind of like saying how come how can Tobey Maguire not be Spider-Man or Ryan Reynolds not be Deadpool I thought he really was Deadpool <laughs> I mean that's not an original joke a lot of people were making jokes like that but it's just so funny um, I don't know. I think that's partly why I like being left wing and liberal is I always try hard to understand the perspective of other people. And that's sort of why I admire someone like Bradley Cooper, who might be left wing, but takes the time to understand what a conservative, the life and mind of a conservative, which is Chris Kyle was very conservative, was a textbook religious kind of gun nut. You know, patriotic American had very simplistic views of uh, good and evil, very simplistic views of America and Iraq. And um, I like that someone like Bradley Cooper, really, I just like any actor taking the time to sincerely understand the point of view of the character they're about to play. 
Um, and I think that would be true. I would admire it even in a conservative. If a conservative said, I'm going to play a liberal character and I'm just going to play it very sincerely and I'm going to do my best to understand this character's point of view and hopefully without judgment to some degree. And so, um, but as I was saying, with a film like American Sniper, well, I mean, that's clearly a, a propaganda film and, uh, you know, but it's a propaganda film in the sense that if you're not making any clear statements about right or wrong, you're contributing to the problem. And and at least that's how I feel. And so if you're going to make a movie about Iraq, you can't really be morally ambiguous about it because you can't be morally ambiguous about an illegal invasion where 300,000 people are getting killed, you know, most of which are innocent lives. You know, that's not a morally ambiguous issue. So um, in this kind of atmosphere, how do you make art that is both political but satisfies your artistic visions? And I was having a big problem with it. And I was trying to write a sort of a comedy, um, but with a, a certain kind of intelligent comedy, I, I guess, or at least that's what I was hoping for. And I was trying to do it with certain a certain level of political intent. And I just found it to be extremely difficult. It was really hard to pull it off because you don't want it to be preachy, um, but you want it to be honest and you want it to address some of the, you know, the issues that we're faced with today, such as political and economic inequality. Um, uh, and so this comedy that I wrote last year, I, I just, I really struggled with it and I felt like I, I didn't do justice to my political intent um and i thought if it's if it's just a comedy and it gets ignored as just a comedy am i contributing to the mass media you know um uh what's the word i'm looking for conveyor belt am i just putting another piece of junk on the mass media conveyor belt for other people to consume or am i doing something good with my time you know uh, and I was really feeling like it's possible that when you make a movie that isn't expressly political, maybe it satisfies my, my artistic vision, like something like Shakespeare, which is it's very intelligent and extremely nuanced and complex, but it doesn't necessarily make any political statements specifically. You know, it's almost it's almost the absence of it. It's just a sort of non-judgmental view of humanity. And that, I think, sometimes doesn't always jive with, with politics, where in politics, there's so much that's wrong, you're trying to do the opposite. You're trying to draw a line in the sand and say, here's what's wrong with our culture. Here's what's wrong with society. My own personal issue is, is that usually movies that make clear political statements don't tend to last for me. I enjoy it for the time that I'm watching it, but it doesn't, I don't remember it. I, they don't become my favorite movies of all time, really. And so that's my dilemma. Do I make a movie that I personally love but has no political value? Or do I make a movie with a political statement where the right and wrong is very clear, but in the end it will date itself because it's too simple, it's too straightforward. And I find that a lot of political problems are so straightforwardly clear in terms of its morality that it's almost artistically uninteresting to depict. That's my dilemma. So last year, I decided I'm going through a personal, you know, kind of like, I mean, crisis is really dramatic. I don't mean it like that, but it was a bit of a, I don't know the word, it was like a fork in the road, a turning point, I felt. And I was like, I don't know what the answer to this is because I don't want to, you know, I just read a book called All Art is Propaganda, which is a collection of George Orwell essays. And the collection was made, put together by a writer named George Packer, who is an excellent writer for The New Yorker, and wrote a book called, I think it's The Unwinding, I think it's called, which I haven't read yet, but I've been dying to read it. Anyway, the guy is really, he's just great as a writer. He wrote a, a great piece on Donald Trump before anybody was really uh, taking him seriously. This guy was taking Trump seriously before anyone else was. So... You know, that kind of prescience is rare. So um, I hit this fork in the road and I decide, 
what am I going to do? Who can I ask for help here? No one is going to understand what my issues are with this. Another part of me thinks maybe film in and of itself just is a medium that isn't capable of tackling the nuances and complexities of the real world problems of our political economy. Maybe film is too visual and a being visual, therefore, too behavioristic to really communicate complexity. And maybe that's why books are more important in the end to learning the depth of a problem. So I decided I would email Noam Chomsky. <laughs> I said, you know what? It's almost like it's like I got a problem and I need to call the bat phone, you know, except it's my Noam Chomsky phone. And I'd heard, you know, I'd heard that Noam Chomsky answers emails that just you can just email him and he might answer you. That's what I'd heard. To be honest, I didn't really believe it, but I, I was desperate and I, th and I thought to myself, I got nothing to lose. So why don't I just um, call the man himself? Or, well, not call him, but why not just email the man himself? I wish I could call him like a bat phone, if it's a Chomsky phone. So I sent an email to Noam Chomsky outlining my dilemma which is essentially what I just explained to you now, which is this conflict between artistic visions and political statements, artistic visions being um, on the one end and political statements being kind of morally straightforward and simple. So in the email, I gave Noam Chomsky an example. I said, I told him, my problem with film is that film tends to focus on moral ambiguity. That's, I mean, it is totally the hallmark of what's considered, you know, artistic, you know, which is fine. I, I, in fact, I like moral ambiguity in storytelling. The problem is, is when you investigate on political injustices, they're rarely morally ambiguous. They're almost always self-evidently immoral and wicked and cruel. And the example I used in my email to Noam Chomsky was the CIA's role in, in uh, removing a democratically elected leader in the Congo, a Republic of the Congo, Democratic Republic of the Congo, I think is the full name, and re replacing a democratically elected leader with uh, basically a puppet, somebody that would be friendly with the United States so that the United States can take resources and not without any real backlash. And if you know the history of the Congo, it is it is a deeply, deeply tragic history with um, replete with murder and genocide and uh, just a complete raping and pillaging of that land and its people by uh, European and, you know, more recently American, you know, colonialists. That kind of tragedy is self-evidently immoral. And so I said, if I were to make a movie about the CIA's role in torturing um, uh, those that opposed um, American involvement, um, it wouldn't be morally ambiguous. It would be a self-evidently clear statement about you know, the, the horrors of American imperialism and just the horrors of imperialism in general. And so I asked basically Chomsky, like, shouldn't I be, if I make a movie, shouldn't I be making movies that are morally self-evident, in which case they're not ambiguous, you know, and, um, you know, and I thought, am I making the wrong decision here? If I want to be ambiguous or if I want to address complexity, am I, is film the right medium or should I be doing something else basically with my time? <laughs> So Noam Chomsky responds literally the next morning, okay? Now, I graduated with a master's degree not that long ago, and even my supervisor didn't respond to my emails the next day. Like, I usually had to wait a week, and I've talked to other graduate students that they say the exact same fucking thing. You email your supervisor, sometimes they don't get back to you in like a week or two. And that doesn't make them bad people, it makes them human. So it puts into perspective that the most famous intellectual in the world responds to my email 
the next morning. Just think about that. Can you imagine how how my how blown my mind was? Just absolutely, it just exploded. I couldn't believe it. I talked, I emailed everybody, I called everybody I knew. Well, not everybody I knew. I have family members that don't really know who Noam Chomsky is. <laughs> So that gives you a bit of a background into my own family life, I guess. But I know what matters is that I know who Noam Chomsky is. And I know what it means to have someone like him respond. Okay. For those of you that don't really know Noam Chomsky, aren't particularly familiar with him. It's the equivalent of having Rene Descartes email you back. It's like as if I wrote a letter to Descartes or John Locke and said, hey, and I send them an email or a letter, and then they write me a letter back. You know, it's basically history talking to you. That's what, what, that's what it means to have someone like Noam Chomsky respond to you. It's basically history talking to you, because Noam Chomsky will be remembered as one of the greatest living intellectuals in the tradition of Bertrand Russell, David Hume, John Locke, Descartes, and so on. So it's a huge fucking deal, is basically what I'm trying to tell you. And um, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe I should get the actual response that he sent to me. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'm making you guys wait. <laughs> yeah, but I figured I would, uh, maybe I read what he said to me word for word. Because it's not very long, but it's still pretty cool. He says... So in the email, I basically said to him, um, you know, as far as I know, I've watched a lot of your interviews. I've read some of your essays and uh, and your intellectual work and political work and so on. And um, I said to him, you know, you haven't formally written about film. And really what I want to know was I want to pick his brain apart when it came to film and politics. Because I just thought, am I being naive in thinking that film can make a difference politically? Do you know what I mean? It's like there's a different, and I, I'll I'll get to what I end up concluding. You know, there's going to be a long podcast episode, and there's just, there's just not much I can do about that. So, Noam Chomsky says to me, "I haven't written about film, but there's no doubt that it can be used both to enlighten audiences and, unfortunately, the opposite, including artistically great work." And the examples he gives are Griffiths, Riefenstahl many others, down to Rambo and the like. There are fine and moving films that do enlighten, like the low-budget Salt of the Earth about 60 years ago and much more. He says, I agree with you about a projected film on the Congo and the like. No plans right now to visit Toronto. Noam Chomsky. How fucking cool is that? Okay? Now, so, basically what Noam Chomsky is saying here as I understand it, is that um, movies can, films can be used to enlighten audiences. Now, the example he gave is Salt of the Earth. So I watched the movie. And I'm going to be honest with you. I thought it was a really well-made movie, but I just, I had a hard time watching it. I just had a hard time going through it. It was the same when I heard Noam Chomsky say about 1984 by George Orwell. Then Noam Chomsky was like, he just said that he had a hard time finishing the book. <laughs> and I get that because sometimes the movie, the books that, that you can't put down might not necessarily be politically interesting. You know, they're not necessarily intellectually on the right side of history. They're just sort of telling you a fun story or a great story. And in the end, it doesn't have much to say about the, the political and economic reality that most people face. Um, or, you know, the notion of propaganda and mass income inequality and gender rights and racism and so on. You know, a lot of my favorite stories are just more fun, you know, or they're more moving and emotional, but not with no particular political statement. Take The Shawshank Redemption. It's probably my all-time favorite film. There's no clear political statement there where it's like, this is right-wing, this is left-wing, or something like that. Or this, these are the policies we need to implement. <laughs> you know, and I feel, and it, it's, it seems to me that the more a film becomes that way, 
the less interesting it becomes because there is no nuance. And in a sense, it's the absence of nuance that affects the work of art itself. And again, I'll come back to the fact that when it comes to politics, the more you investigate in a problem, the more you realize it becomes clear what the right side is and what the wrong side is. And so when I watched the movie Salt of the Earth that Noam Chomsky himself recommended, I was just like, you know, I didn't want to admit it because I admire Noam Chomsky so much that I wanted to like it. And I just really struggled. And it's not anything about the film itself because it was it's really well made. It's almost like a Bicycle Thieves type of movie. Hey, what's that? Am I hearing music? Oh, hold on a second. What can I do here? There we go. Sorry about that. I'm getting, there's some noise going on here in the background. There's a mistake I just made, but I'm gonna keep charging forward here. So where was I? I just lost my train of thought because there's this noise going on in the background. So Salt of the Earth, it's a good movie, but I didn't love it in the sense of on a personal level. It didn't make me will go, man, I got to watch that movie again. I got to watch that movie again. You know, it didn't have that effect because its statement is so clear that workers deserve rights. That's what the movie is about. And that workers, especially when you're poor and you're a woman, you are going to live in a society where um, your rights are going to be treated as less valuable than the rights of others. When you're poor, you're going to be treated as less valuable than the wealthy. When you're poor, you're not going to be heard, but the wealthy will be heard. And that, that the reality of being of a being a second class citizen in the world today uh, is still relevant, and it's certainly true in the movie Salt of the Earth. But it it's I'm more interested in making f stories that um, deal with kinds of the kinds of nuances that I'm interested in. And they're, in a sense, the things that I'm interested in artistically are, in a sense, apolitical. They're more about the universal humanistic experiences. And Noam Chomsky's email made me realize that about myself, that in the end, I'm not sure I want to make movies that are expressly political, just for the simple fact that that doesn't seem to um, push my button, my artistic button. It doesn't seem to get me, you know? It doesn't move me in that way. Um, and if I'm going to do things that are about politics, I'd rather, I feel like a podcast or conversation or kind of political jokes, like in this conversational way that I'm doing, that's fun. But to sit down and write an entire screenplay about a political issue, I just don't seem to have that inspiration. I don't have it in me. And... Um, it might be good for the culture that I live in. I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. I just know what's what makes sense to me. And what makes sense to me is to keep them, in a sense, separate. I suppose not that different from Noam Chomsky, which is he has his linguistics work, which is just purely theoretical and intellectual and apolitical. And then he has his political work, you know? And they're just two different worlds. And I'm thinking that that's where my life is going to go in that direction in a way. But... I don't like them to keep them too separate either because I don't like how artists capitalize on being apolitical so that they can make money. That bothers me too. I don't know. I don't know where I stand. All I know is whatever screenplay I write next will probably be apolitical if I do write one. Um, but the interesting thing about the Noam Chomsky email was on the one hand, I'm like, he's right. And that films, in a way, do contribute to the enlightening of society. Maybe not one particular film, but it's more like you can be part of a movement. You know, when you start to make films and everyone else is doing it, there is, there is a, there's an effect that a film will have, even if it's marginal. Even if it's small, I think it can have a positive effect on audiences. And I don't think it's naive to think that. But at the same time, you know, there are limits to the impact that a film can have. Um... Either way, I, I realize that I've been looking at it the wrong way and just you have to do what's true to you artistically. And if you're moved artistically to do things that are apolitical, then that's just who you are. And uh, 
And the reason I'm doing this podcast and addressing political issues to some degree is because I am moved in that way. So there's something about podcasting and this particular medium that lends itself to discussing politics to some degree. So that's where I'm at. So Noam Chomsky, thank you. <laughs> I didn't respond to him. I don't know why I didn't. I just thought, you know, he this man is busy enough. The last thing he needs is another email from me. So, but you know, who knows? Sometimes I think, you know, maybe I can get, well, I don't want to jinx it. So anyway, that's that. Now, what does this have to do with the movie Captain Fantastic? Because Captain Fantastic managed to pull off the thing that I couldn't do last year. It actually was a movie that was as political as I would ever want a movie to be in a way, which was these are people that read the characters in this movie have they celebrate Noam Chomsky Day which is Noam Chomsky's birthday which I think is December 7th or I think it's December 7th and that's because it's that's Noam Chomsky's birthday and so they celebrate Noam Chomsky's birthday and they call it Noam Chomsky Day and I thought oh I'd love to do something like that uh so you know if I ever have a wife and kids that would be great it would be great to have a Noam Chomsky Day and some of the things, some of the scenes here written are very explicitly political, that they read Noam Chomsky, that they see the war industry for what it is, um, that they understand that American foreign policy is designed to exploit and, and in a sense, um, deliver terror to people, to, in a sense, exacerbate terror. That's what it does at a factual level. Like, if you look at the facts, the more they fought terror, the United States, or claimed that to fight terror, the bigger terrorism became, the wider the network it becomes. Because as Noam Chomsky says, when you smash terrorism with a hammer, it spreads. You know, kind of like a virus, almost like a virus. There's a certain way, you have to be very calculated about how to deal with something as, as poisonous and deadly as terrorism. So um, these are characters in the movie. These little kids are so intelligent in this way. They're uniquely intelligent in the sense that they're so young, but so hyper aware of sort of the world that they live in, in a way. And yet at the same time, these kids are very sheltered because they're growing up and off the grid. So they don't really in interact with the outside world. So part of the, the beauty of this film is on the one hand, they're extremely sheltered and closed off from everything. And on the other hand, they're so acutely aware of problems that most adults don't even know, understand. And, and it was so inspiring and moving to watch this because I finally saw a, a writer in Matt Ross who managed to pull it off, managed to say something political without beating you over the head, without making it dull or boring, and having the kind of, um, it's just going to be one of those movies that I'm going to come back to, and when I watch it again, I'm going to enjoy it again. You know, it has a lasting quality to it. I was just so amazed that he was able to pull it off, because I tried so hard last year to do something similar, and I just didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to marry the two. So this guy pulled it off. He, he made a movie that people on the progressive left can watch and feel like, oh, this movie was made for me. And at the same time, I feel like even some of my more conservative relatives can watch it and understand some of the fundamentals in this movie because on the one hand, they're very eccentric and progressive left, extremely you know, they're progressive left, but they're progressive left in ways that I would never be. Like, I would never live off the grid, you know. I just couldn't do it. I'm too much of a, you know, pampered city boy. But this this family does it. But certain aspects of this progressive left family are so universal, where it's just ultimately about the death of a loved one. How do you cope with loss? How do you relate to each other as a family? How do you... um relate to people who don't share your views how do you reconcile those things how do you manage them you know and i of course i related to it because i come from a situation where i'm not like uh, and like uh, some families and some people i met who are very liberal they come from a family of, family of liberals you know and i almost feel like saying you guys are spoiled <laughs> You know what I mean? Try living with a bunch of conservatives for the rest of your life. You know what I mean? Then come talk to me. 
it, it's just the reality is very different when you come from when you've had to deal with very conservative values and not that my family is super conservative because they're not but they are they talk like moderate republicans sometimes on certain issues and so i totally understand and relate when i see a movie depict progressive lefties juxtaposed with cons more conservative mainstream thinkers and and the, i can to the mo movie so beautifully depicts the conflict of it and how painful it can be and it, it's just so beautifully done uh so my hats off to the makers of captain fantastic the entire cast and to matt ross in particular and vigo mortensen who's just a I mean, just a fantastic captain. <laughs> He's a captain, fantastic actor. Um, just a, one of the finest actors right now. And really every movie I've ever seen him in, he's just so good in it. He always chooses right. And this is another one of those movies. So, you know, there you have it. That's been my odyssey. Going from an artistic crisis last year to emailing Noam Chomsky to having Noam Chomsky fucking email me back which is incredible to really feel like I failed in trying to, to merge the political with the artistic and feeling like maybe I don't want them to come together. Maybe, you know, my vocation is not that and it doesn't feel like it is. It just doesn't seem to interest me. But then I watch a movie like Captain Fantastic and all of a sudden my world is turned upside down and I realize maybe I'm wrong about everything. So I don't know, you know, uh, I do, right now I'm leaning more towards apolitical stuff. And for, if you are a writer, these are the big decisions. These are the things that affect everything you do. Um, the last screenplay I wrote I was kind of apolitical and it, and it said, didn't really get into it too much. I mean, there's a little bit, there's always a little bit, but um, not really. And I was totally happy with it in a sense. It was just like, well, that's, you know, that's not what the story is about. The story is about something universal, about the loss of a family member and how do you cope with it. And, um, you know, that's just universal. It doesn't matter w what your political leanings are. You know, it's just how do you manage that? How do you manage falling in love or not falling in love or falling out of love? How do you deal with these things? And sometimes these things are funny, you know. So, I don't know. That's where I'm at. <laughs> that's where it's at anyway so if you've managed to listen this long to this episode you know kudos to you uh, especially with some of the meanderings and the distractions and stuff happening in between but it's a pretty big deal when Noam Chomsky emails you and I didn't really talk about it publicly I don't know why but I just didn't you know privately to some friends but it was it was really inspiring to uh, get an email from someone so brilliant um and uh yeah that's i've really run out of stuff to say so you know what to do you can subscribe to this uh podcast on youtube if you find me at uh, youtube it's just the six podcast uh just google me or search you can find the six podcast at uh, on iTunes, just type in The Six Podcast and Pablo or The Six Podcast and Petrucci and you'll find me right away. Um, and you can also find me on SoundCloud. Again, same thing, search for The Six Podcast. Um, and anywhere else, yeah, my Twitter feed is at The Six Podcast, so you can find me there. And I'm usually posting, you know, either the past episodes and, and whatnot or past songs that I've recorded and I'm sharing them and uh, just trying to keep it consistent. Uh, so thanks for listening. This is The Sixth Podcast with Pablo Petrucci. I'm your host of The Machine. Bye.